subcontinent floods have killed at least 34 people in Mozambique, while rescuers are trying to reach people trapped on rooftops and trees. 16 people have been killed in central Zambezia province since heavy rains sparked the floods last weekend. The figure could be even higher because there was no information from all the areas that had been cut off. A total of 200,000 people were estimated to have been affected in the province where helicopters were dropping food to isolated areas. South Africa has sent a team of soldiers and health workers to help with the rescue efforts. Heavy rains have also devastated neighboring Malawi, where 48 have been killed and about 70,000 have been left homeless. Malawi's president, Peter Maturika, declared a third of the country as a disaster zone and urgently appealed for foreign aid. These southern African states have been hit by late summer storms Bad weather is expected to continue for several days.
listen to this. Okay, so it's 11.28 p.m. And that sound has not stopped for the past 30 minutes. And it's coming from above. Google Maps, there is no factories around, no airports, nothing.
We need to kill them. We need to kill them. The radical Muslim terrorists hell-bent on killing us. You're in danger. I'm in danger. We're at war, and this is not going to stop. After this week's brutal terror attacks in France, hopefully everybody now gets it. It is time for this to be over and stop sending American dollars to any Arab country that does not support this mission. Pakistan at the top of the list. Force Arab nations to choose. They're either with us or they're against us. And stop with this nuclear negotiation nonsense. They don't operate the way we do. 
You can't negotiate, you can't mediate, and you can't bargain. You can't even reason with these people. Now, Egyptian President el-Sisi, a Muslim in a country, 85% Muslim, rid Egypt, the largest Arab country, of these Islamic fanatics. He threw out Hamas terrorists and outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood, the mother of all terrorist organizations. And ironically, days before the attack in France, that same president, El Sisi, called for a religious revolution to take out the violent jihadist. He called on the imams and the religious establishment to lead the fight, saying the entire world is waiting for their next move. Now, I've been telling you for a year that they're coming for us, that there is a reverse crusade in progress, a Christian genocide, hundreds of thousands of innocents killed in the Middle East. And seven months ago, I said that we need to bomb ISIS as it began its steamroll through Iraq. Bomb them, bomb them, and bomb them again, for which I was roundly criticized. Our country's response to this threat? The FBI destroys tens of thousands of documents deemed offensive to Islam. The CIA removes the word Islamic before terrorist in those Benghazi talking points. The Fort Hood massacre, the Oklahoma beheading, both workplace violence. Are we morons? Of course, none of this should be a surprise, given that our president invited the Muslim Brotherhood to fill the first two rows of his apology for being an American speech in Cairo in 2009. And as we cower to these Islamic fanatics, our president and former Secretary of State Clinton say they will prosecute the man who made the video, free speech be damned. They call murders accompanied by Allah Akbar, workplace violence. This surrender is nothing more than a coward's response to the fear of this fanatical terrorism. And this political correctness will be the death of us. They can kill us, but we can't hurt their feelings? I'm surprised the president hasn't signed a new executive order that simply says, don't offend Muslims. And make no mistake, as sure as I'm talking to you, there will be efforts to limit our First Amendment, our free speech, to comply with Sharia blasphemy laws, which call for death to those who slander the Prophet Muhammad. And at a time when we have never been in more danger, our president is focused on free community college on his continuing march to reduce the size of the military and eviscerate our national security. Our government's response to the terror threat is to have an interfaith dialogue to try to understand and empathize with the enemy. And when they want to shut us up, they call us Islamophobes. Muslim groups like CARE and the Nation of Islam have been integrated into our society. Muslims invited to worship at our national cathedral in Washington, D.C. We're directed by a political correctness that is so bizarre, so disconnected from reality, that it does nothing but assist our enemy in our own destruction. They have conquered us through immigration. They have conquered us through interfaith dialogue. And they have conquered us by co-opting our leaders into a position of embarrassment. Now, the Prime Minister of France, just a few hours ago, stated that France is at war with radical Islam. Why can't our president even say the words radical Islam or Islamic terrorist, let alone protect us Americans? It's not like we haven't been, uh, that we haven't suffered from these fanatical terrorists. Thousands of Americans have died at their hands. The World Trade Center, the USS Cole, Tanzania, Fort Hood, Benghazi. But when the head of MI5, one of the most secretive positions, shows his face to the world, saying that Britain is going to get hit next, 
it is time to get serious. And as this, as this Islamic cancer metastasizes throughout the world, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Ansar al-Sharia in Libya, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and as it goes to Europe, it is headed our way. Our forefathers gave up everything, their fortunes, their families, their lives, to create a government where free speech and freedom of religion were sacrosanct. This surrender, this refusal to even call it what it is, is an insult to my father and my grandfather and everyone who served in the armed forces who fought to protect what is sacred to every American. Boko Haram sacked the town, burning it to the ground and killing hundreds, possibly thousands of people. A local government official says more than 2,000 people in Baga and surrounding villages may have been massacred. The lucky ones escaped by bus or simply on foot. Others reportedly drowned trying to get away by swimming into Lake Chad. Boko Haram has terrorized northern Nigeria for five years now. It wants to establish an Islamic state there. Amnesty International says the murderous assault may be Boko Haram's deadliest ever. So many developments today. Of course, uh, one of the others is that France uh, has issued a new warning 
to members of the police force uh, that it is believed that terror cells, sleeper cells, have been activated with plans to target police, uh, warnings to police to keep their weapons at hand or erase their social media profiles. How significant do you think this terror warning is and how significant do you think the current threat is? My sense is the French wouldn't go public with this, Jim, if they didn't really think there was a threat. I think there probably have been cells activated in France, whether they're going to be effective or not, we're going to have to wait to see. But, but, but more than that, it's these attackers have refined their targets to people in uniform. They haven't set off bombs in the metro or in public spaces. And, and it's also the assassinations against the weekly uh, cartoonist magazine. Uh, tells me they're getting more sophisticated as well as their tactics because you look at that uh, attack on the magazine and the grouping of the bullets through the police car and the rest of it tells me these people are well trained and disciplined which makes them more difficult to to run down. in Paris, an unwavering show of force and defiance from every corner of the world with one resounding message. Everybody is together to fight against terrorism, to show the world we are fighting against it and we will never give up. Throughout a reminder of the foundations in which this country was built on, Lady Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité values the French hold so dear. From the Place de la République, in their hundreds of thousands, they marched. At the heart of the march, with some in silence and other in tears, the families and friends who lost their loved ones this week. Staring from above, Stéphane Chabonnier, or Charb, the editor of Charlie Hebdo. A respectful distance behind them, arm in arm and in a show of support and solidarity, heads of state and dignitaries from all over the world, Europe, Africa and the Middle East, many with differing political visions, some with clear divisions, on this day united. Behind them religious leaders from the Jewish community who will be burying their dead. Blame France. That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points Memo. The debate over Muslim extremism continues to rage here in the USA and in Western Europe. Some liberal folks believe religion should not be part of the equation, that most Muslims are good people and the jihadists should not be associated with Islamic theology. That seemed to be President Obama's point of view as well. But after the Paris massacre, the French government no longer believes that. What I want to say is, uh, as the French Prime Minister has said, we are at war, and we are at war with radical Islam. Just today, Belgian authorities shot it out with some jihadists, killing two men who were heavily armed. Apparently the men had ties to Syria. But no matter how many jihadist incidents take place, it's tough to convince the left-wing zealots to see things clearly. There is a prevailing feeling in France among many Muslims that they are not treated as part of the state at large. So there's a feeling there that, that Muslims may be bullied, that they may be pushed to the side. There were, they passed a law recently that, that banned the full face veil, which many Muslims took as an affront because it's a religious belief. So because France wants to remain a secular society, they have invited Islamic terrorism, according to Mr. Apologists for the Jihad used to be considered cranks and dismissed, but now we have the New York Times leading the way on the leave the Muslims alone front. Christoph is a chief apologist for the excesses of Islam and is too frightened to debate the issue, hiding under his desk, tapping out his little columns. Now, the reason I'm so annoyed with the left on the issue is that it's flat out dangerous. The cold truth that the left will never admit is that violence against infidels is accepted even encouraged in most Muslim nations. There are violent imams everywhere, including the USA. We spotlighted some of the radical mosques here last night. I hope you saw that report. Now, there's zero chance that President Obama will change his point of view. Everyone working for him knows he's not going to confront the jihad. Even as reports say ISIS is gaining ground in Syria, 
the president has released five more terrorists from Guantanamo Bay. Even as another American nut is arrested for alleged jihadist terror activity in Ohio this time, the White House spokesman continues to parse words. Mr. Obama knows what's going on. He just feels more comfortable looking away. Every time we see this exchange, it seems like the answer is so tortured, like it's so difficult to say what everybody around the world seems to feel so clearly it is. And what the leaders have said in Canada and Australia and Paris, where they have felt it so potently and personally, they've all said quite clearly that the battle is against Islamic extremism. Why is that so hard to say? Well, it's not hard to say, but it's not the only kind of extremism we face. I would recommend uh, to, to folks looking at this administration's counterterrorism record, I would remind people that more terrorists who claim uh, to, to, to do acts of violence in the name of Islam have been taken off the battlefield in this administration than under any previous one because of our counterterrorism operations and our efforts that we've put in place. But that's not the only way that you counter this kind of extremism. Much of it Islamic, you're absolutely right, uh, but some of it not. So we're going to focus on all the different kinds of extremism with a heavy focus on people who do this in the name of Islam. We would say falsely in the name of Islam, but there are other forms of extremism that are this. also what other, important. Tell me, what other forms of extremism are particularly troubling and compelling to you right now? Well, look, there are people out there who want to kill other people uh, in the name of a variety of causes. Of course, uh, Martha, we are most focused on people doing this in the name of Islam. airports concern al-qaeda in yemen one group tied to the terror attack in paris has a new plot to take down planes in the u.s and this morning in paris a commemoration for the officers killed in that attack and a new arrest announced overnight abc's brian ross is tracking all the latest good morning brian well good morning george french authorities report this morning that a suspected accomplice of last week's attackers has been arrested in bulgaria as they look for even more members of the terrorist terror thought to be on the loose this morning all this as U.S. authorities are putting in place a series of urgent security steps designed to stop what they fear could be another wave of attempted airplane bombings. U.S. airport screeners this morning are under orders to enhance the number of random searches they carry out on passengers and carry-on luggage, an order first issued last week but only being made public now. The security order comes in the wake of this alarming step-by-step -step recipe of kitchen ingredients for what Al-Qaeda calls, in its latest magazine, Inspire, the hidden bomb to bring down an airplane. The device is designed to get by standard airport magnetometers and would only be detected by full-body scanner machines, which are not present at many smaller airports. Quote, through this large loophole, the instructions read, you can pass through many American airports. This group is absolutely determined to try to take out an attack on a U.S.-bound airplane. On the terror front in France this morning, the search resumes amid unprecedented security for other members of the terror cell that attacked last week. Officials acknowledge at least two of them got away the girlfriend of the gunman at the grocery store, and an accomplice, both seen in this airport surveillance video arriving in Turkey and both now believed to be in Syria. As French authorities try to unravel the plot, one question involves how the terrorists got such heavy-duty weapons. This new video shows the two brothers holding up a gas station with automatic weapons and over the shoulder of one of them, an extremely powerful military rocket launcher. The U.S. military Monday came face to face with another terror weapon as supposed ISIS followers took over the Twitter feed and the YouTube channel of the U.S. Central Command, headquarters for American efforts against the terrorists. They posted ISIS videos and this threat, American soldiers, we are coming, watch your back.
Think terror training camps are only located in places like Pakistan? Think again. Our next guest has proof that radical Muslims are training to wage jihad right here in our own backyard. Dozens of terrorist training compounds have been scattered across the United States of America. And an FBI agent came up to our office and said, do you understand you have a terrorist compound of Islamic Muslim training about 30 miles from your office, so you better be careful with what you're doing. Yeah. And That's how we came in arrested. Also, I understand a guy who uh, was recruited out of prison to live and wound up living with these uh, people at the terror training camps who have been working with the NYPD, a fellow by the name of Ali Aziz, came up to you and he goes, look, I, I got to tell you the story because if people knew what was going on here, they'd be horrified. Yeah, you know, Steve, most people have never heard of Jamaat Afruka in the United States. It's a very foreign name, but almost everybody's heard of Wall Street Journal Daniel Pearl. Sure. And Daniel Pearl was on his way to investigate the leader of these compounds in America when he was kidnapped and beheaded and dismembered. Lingerie, alcohol, and underage drinking. That's what sheriff's deputies say they found at a party in Poway over the weekend. It was an 18-year-old's birthday with a Playboy Mansion theme. New at 7, Team 10 investigator Allison Ash has the explicit message from the birthday girl's mother. We found these pictures on Instagram, but most of them have since been marked private. Many were tagged, Liv's Playboy Mansion. Liv is Olivia Lake, a Poway High School student seen here celebrating her 18th birthday with a pipe in her mouth. Here's where the party happened at this spacious house owned by Liv's parents on a quiet street in Poway. We found a beer can tossed in the bushes next door. It was the only sign of the party that sheriff's deputies say had 200 guests, most of them under the age of 18. Sheriff's deputies say two of them were passed out. They also say Olivia's dad, Jeff Lake, who posed for this picture with his daughter, was in the house when deputies arrived. Once they determined that there was a sizable amount of underage drinking going on inside the house and that he was allowing it, they took Mr. Lake into custody. Lake is an attorney who specializes in medical marijuana cases. He, Olivia, and her mom, Jackie, the former Poway High PTA president, were featured on the 92064 magazine a couple of years ago. Here's the message she tweeted mentioning her daughter December 6th. Happiest birthday to the baddest bee in town.
A WEST MICHIGAN CITY JUST DODGED A LAWSUIT. PEOPLE TELL 24 HOUR NEWS 8 THEY WERE PLANNING TO SUE THE CITY OF GRAND HAVEN OVER THE 48-FOOT CROSS THAT OVERLOOKS THE CITY. THAT IS UNTIL THE CITY COUNCIL VOTED LAST NIGHT TO TURN IT INTO AN ANCHOR. NEW TONIGHT, 24 HOUR NEWS 8'S DANNY CARLSON HAS THIS STORY FROM GRAND HAVEN TELLING US JUST HOW CLOSE THE CITY WAS TO GOING TO COURT. We spoke with one of the people who is at the forefront of the Remove the Cross movement here in Grand Haven. He said if the city hadn't done anything, they were planning on filing the preliminary paperwork to sue within the month. But he says as long as the city of Grand Haven follows through with turning the cross into an anchor, he says there won't be any reason to take them to court. We'll remain vigilant and continue to monitor the situation and, you know, go that route again if we need to. Scott? No. Chris? Yes. Vanessa? Yes. Airholzer? Yes. Michaela? Absolutely not. The city council's 3-2 to two vote to turn the 50-year-old, nearly 50-foot cross into an anchor is not only a victory for the little guy, says Brian Plesher, one of the leaders of the Remove the Cross movement. He says it's a victory for civil rights. I actually think this is very good for the community, and I was very pleased to see that one of the council members said that they need to begin to recognize the diversity that's present in this community. A 15-year-old girl killed her 16-year-old brother after relatives had abused her for years. That's according to investigators in, in tiny White Springs, Florida, which is just west of Jacksonville. They say this girl shot her brother with her parents' gun on Monday while they were out of town. Investigators also say the girl got help from her 11-year-old sister. Years and years of abuse. Prosecutors say they're debating whether to charge the girls as adults. The parents face charges of child neglect. 
disturbing plan by some young kids at a local elementary school has shocked the small town of Elba in Genesee County. The group of fourth graders were reportedly plotting to kill their teacher. Fourth graders. Tonya Sides' Erica Brecker tells us how officials say the students had planned to carry out their plan and what possible punishment they will face. According to the Genesee County Sheriff's Department incident report, three fourth graders, all between 9 and 10 years old, were upset with their teacher. The students knew their teacher is highly allergic to antibacterial hand sanitizer, and they knew it's banned from the classroom, so the three children were allegedly going to sneak it in. The report says the suspects made comments to other students that they were going to kill the teacher by putting antibacterial products around the classroom. A new technique using DNA that might give scientists the power to solve cases that have gone cold. Cases like the double murder of a South Carolina mother and her three year old daughter that happened four years ago, still a mystery. Some scientists believe a suspect's physical traits can be recreated from a speck of blood or a strand of hair. Lance Ulanoff, the editor at large and chief correspondent for Mashable.com. How are you, Lance? Morning to you. Good morning. Virginia Company is working the, with uh, what the government on this. Right, right. And it's called Snapshot Technology. Right, right. How does so, it work? How right, so they the Paragon use it? Company says that they can look at a part of the DNA sample and really just like tiny, tiny bits of it to identify traits that are for many person, like hair, eye color, freckles, uh, skin color, ethnicity, and so, so things that would kind of build a profile for a, a person. And why would this be important? Because usually DNA is used to match one sample against another. You know, you pick someone up, or you find DNA, or you arrest someone, and you match them against, maybe they've committed another crime, and you can tell by DNA sample. In this case, you have no suspect. You, all you have is a DNA sample, and they say they can build a composite. The parents of a middle school student are upset. They say a teacher told their 12-year-old son he couldn't read his favorite book in school. The book? The Bible. The parents say their son's fundamental rights were violated. Fox 4's Monica Evans joins us live right here in the studio with the tales of that. Monica, what have you found out about this? Well, Phil, the parents of 12-year-old loyal grandstaff says they're taking a grand stance to stand up for their son's freedom of religion after they say a teacher told their son he couldn't read his Bible in school. Behold, I say, Loyal Grandstaff says he loves reading his Bible. 
and decided to bring it to school before Christmas break so he can read it during his free time. But the seventh grader says his teacher told him it wasn't allowed. I like to read my Bible because it's, a, it's a good book. The 12 year old says he wasn't reading out loud and he says he wasn't sharing the Bible with his classmates. I was just reading. I was just reading because I had free time. I had time to do what I wanted to. So I started just started broke I just broke it out and read. Were you bothering anybody when you read it? I shouldn't have been. There's kids walking around disrespecting their teacher, you know, kids walking around cussing and everything else, and they're practically getting in no trouble at all.